Okay, so that means we can start. Yeah. So uh, I thought I would talk a little bit more. Huh? Yeah, you okay with that? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See what happens. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the uh, kind of basis of uh, meditation practice, uh, how it uh, how we can make the path work more quickly for us. Some of the perceptions. I think the the title for the um, event today. What was it? The event perceiving like a Buddha, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how to develop our perceptions in such a way that it actually supports <clears throat> the meditation practice. And uh, one of the um, uh, good places to start is to actually start with the idea of uh, meditation. One of the, uh, uh, the suttas that speaks about this particularly is found in the uh, uh, Satipatthana uh, Sanyutta. So, you know, Satipatthana practice uh, is kind of the idea um, very often taught as the idea of Buddhist meditation in the Satipatthana Sutta, the discourse on uh, mindfulness meditation, or however, however you want to translate it. Uh, the only wrong translation is foundations of mindfulness. So don't translate it like that. That is bad. <laughs> it is either the establishing things of mindfulness or the applications of mindfulness, which is a much more appropriate rendering of that word, uh, and not really foundations of mindfulness. Uh, and the reason is very simply that foundation of mindfulness gives the idea that you do meditation to get mindfulness, when in fact what it really is about uh, it is using mindfulness and applying it to the meditation object. Uh, that is actually what it is referring to in the suttas. Uh. And so if you go to the um, uh, Satipatthana Sutta or the Satipatthana Sangyutta, which are the connected discourses on Satipatthana, you find some interesting information about the supports or the foundations or the basis for Satipatthana practice, uh, what has to be in place uh, for this kind of meditation to work. Yeah. But before we go there, I want to just very briefly touch on another very important sutta that, that deals with the same topic, yeah, and that is the Anapanasati Sutta, yeah, yeah the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing, yeah, and uh, Satipatthana <coughs> and Anapanasati are very closely related to each other. Yeah. And you find this specifically when you go to the Anapanasati Sutta, it says there that when you do mindfulness of breathing, you fulfill everything in Satipatthana, everything in mindfulness meditation. It is really all you have to do. Yeah. If you practice mindfulness of breathing, you have the four Satipatthanas, the four areas, which are the body contemplation, the feelings, the mind, the, and the Dhammas, which are mental phenomena or principles or something like that. And so if you, all you have to do is mindfulness of breathing and you fulfill everything on the path of meditation, which is very interesting here, yeah, because very often the way that uh, <clears throat> mindfulness of breathing is taught, uh, it is taught as fulfilling the beginning yeah, of Satipatthana and then you go on to feelings and mind, but actually it fulfills everything here. Yeah. It simplifies the path nicely. Yeah? All you have to do is watch the breath there. Yeah. And based on that, guess what? Uh, you can become enlightened. Uh, it's a good deal, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so simple. Just watching the breath. Uh, simple in principle, not so simple in, uh, in reality, of course. Uh, and uh, so it says in there that you fulfill uh, all the meditation just by feel, uh, doing mindfulness of breathing. So what are the specific instructions on mindfulness of breathing here? <clears throat> and the instructions are something uh, along the following lines uh, yeah so the um, uh, it starts off by saying that you go to a secluded place uh, you go to a secluded monastery in london uh, is that right is it, this is <laughs> it's, it's not bad right this is kind of a bit out of the way it's kind of not not too noisy uh, and it is uh, you get a little bit away from home which is good uh, and you kind of meet together so sometimes you don't have much choice uh, you kind of make do whatever you have so it's not kind of the middle of the forest uh, or maybe the concrete jungle, but not the, for, not the real forest. Uh, so you uh, you make do what you have. Uh, and then you sit down. Uh, yeah, so you're all sitting, so you're all doing really well with that one. I got that one right. Uh, <laughs> and then you, it says you uh, set your body straight. Uh, yeah, and the idea, of course, with a straight body is that it encourages mindfulness a little bit. Uh, so you have your body reasonably straight. But again, you don't force that. Uh, you do it at the right time and right place when it feels natural to be mindful and the body kind of straightens by itself almost. You feel, okay, oops, and it kind of happens. And then comes this idea that you establish mindfulness in front of you. Satting parimukkan upatafetva. 
I always quote a few Pali lines because it makes me sound more and like gives me more authority when I do that. Then, so I always do that on purpose. Uh, so uh, I hope you are suitably impressed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if not, I have failed in my <laughs> my mission. So this idea, yeah. So this comes before we start watching the breath, Satting parimukang upatapetra, having established mindfulness in front of you. Uh, so before you watch any breathing, before you do anything that feels like meditation practice, you establish mindfulness. This is what I was talking about before, about learning how to relax properly and to sit back, uh, waiting in the present, uh, maybe using a little bit of nudging of the mind to give sense of a bit of, you know, good feelings and these kind of things. Uh, and then uh, when uh, mindfulness is established, I'm going to come back in a second a bit more about how to establish mindfulness. Uh, then you breathe in uh, mindful, you breathe out mindful. Uh, yeah, and then comes the instructions of the Anapanasati Sutta, which comes in 16 steps. Uh, so then it says that uh, uh, breathing in long, uh, you know that you're breathing in long. Uh, breathing out long, you know that you're breathing out long. Uh, breathing in short, uh, you know that you're breathing in short. Uh, breathing out short, you know that you're breathing out short. Uh, um, breathe, <coughs> breathing, uh, you train uh, breathing may I experience or experiencing the whole breath. You train breathing in, experiencing the whole breath. You train breathing in, calming the bodily process, which basically is the breath. Breathing out, you're calming the bodily process. And this is the initial stages of anapanasati or mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, very simple. Just awareness of the breath. It doesn't really, you don't, don't need to make it long or short. You shouldn't actually make it long or short. It's just that the breath is there and you are aware of it. And the quality tends to be long first, shorter afterwards. And as the mind becomes more mindful, your awareness of the breath expands. So you can kind of see the whole breath, yeah? Experiencing the whole breath. Then as your mindfulness becomes even stronger and you allow the process to happen, then it starts to calm down even more. And the breath becomes really nice and peaceful. And that is already really good. Yeah, if you get to that point, you're already doing really well, and you're going to enjoy the meditation even by that much. Uh, the very beginning of anapanasati, uh, and beyond that comes all the blissful experiences. Yeah, the piti, the sukha, uh, the <clears throat> mental uh, kind of the mental image of the breath, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so all beyond that, even more powerful, even more beautiful. Uh, and then it takes you all the way to the real samadhi, the jhana states, and these kind of things. Uh, so this is the basic idea of mindfulness of breathing, yeah? Just knowing with, with the breath and then expanding your awareness and allowing everything to calm down. And all of this happens as a natural process. Nothing you have to do. You don't have to make this happen. You just stand back. And the more you stand back and the more you allow things to be, the more this happens as a matter of course, yeah? Nothing you have to do except be aware of the breath. And this happens by itself, and if it doesn't happen by itself, this is the reason. Yeah, the reason is now you have to go back again to the foundations of Satipatthana practice, of mindfulness meditation. What is the foundation? Well, the Buddha says two things are the foundation. And one thing you know already, because I mentioned it this morning, that is sila. Yeah? Sila is the idea of mora morality, ethics, kindness, if you like. Yeah? So sila is one of them. And Again, as I said this morning, sila in Buddhism is actually very demanding. It's very difficult to be 100% ethical in Buddhism. And that's why we can usually up our game a little bit more to become even more uh, kind, if you like. Yeah. That is one aspect of it. But the other aspect, which is very interesting, uh, is the idea of right view, yeah, or straight view. This actually is a direct support of meditation practice. <laughs> and this is what... Uh, the title of this uh, 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 day's meditation is about uh, anyway, yeah, having the right perspective, seeing things in the right way, perceiving like the Buddha. Perceiving is really just an other way of talking about right view. You're seeing the world in the right way. Yeah. And of course, that right view or the right perception, they are also the very foundation of the Buddhist path. In fact, number one, samaditi, yeah, right view. Yeah. That kind of makes sense because if you haven't got any kind of right view, why would we even enter any spiritual practice? Uh, if you have no idea that all that matters in life is to you know, make as much money as you have and kind of enjoy yourself, then the spiritual path becomes irrelevant. Uh, 
So a little bit of right view is required at the beginning here, but very interesting. It's also really important for meditation practice itself, uh, and that's fascinating here. So where shall we start with the idea of uh, perceiving the world in the right way here? Now, there was a young man at the talk yesterday. He's not here today. No, I'm just looking around. He's not here today. <laughs> And young, I say young, but young means younger than me. So it doesn't mean all that young necessarily. It means kind of, it's weird how this changes as we get older, right? When you're young, young is like, we, when everyone seems young when they're younger than you. It's kind of strange. It's really deluding here. I need to remind myself, okay, get real, get real. <laughs> anyway, so he, uh, he asked me this question, young or not. Uh, he, uh, and he, and what he said was, uh, you know, why should I believe in rebirth? Uh, what are the benefits of believing in rebirth? Uh, and actually, I think it's a very good question there, uh, because we say we have this idea but that believing in rebirth is an aspect of right view, right? Uh, but what difference does it really make? Uh, can't you be moral without believing in rebirth? Uh, and of course, again, uh, if you are wise, you know that morality leads to happiness right here in this life. Yeah, Do you feel much better about yourself? Do you have much more self-worth and all of these kind of things uh, if you live a good life? Uh, so if that is the case, if you can be moral and kind and caring and do the right things without rebirth, the idea of rebirth, then why exactly uh, should we believe in this? Uh, and so I wanted to talk very briefly about that, maybe say something similar to what I said to him yesterday. Uh, and the reason we should believe in rebirth uh, is because it changes your investment strategy. Have you got an investment strategy uh, for your life? Uh, yeah. Okay, now the wrong place to go to get, get an, a good investment strategy is to go to the bank. Yeah. Uh, they don't know anything about long-term. We're talking about long-term investment here. Yeah. They're all into short-term investment. Uh, so don't trust those ordinary investment advisors in the world. Uh, the best investment advisor in the world is sitting right here behind us. Yeah, the Buddha, number one investment advisor here. But if you want to learn about investment, go to the Buddha. So what does the Buddha say about investment? And what he says, and this is, of course, is kind of one of those very important points of Dhamma, is that what if you invest in those ordinary things in life, yeah, if you invest in relationships, if you invest in uh, uh, in uh, material possessions, uh, if you invest in status, whatever status you have in this life, uh, all of these things are things that are tied to this very life, tied to this very existence. Uh, yeah, well, on, when you die, uh, all of these things at the very latest, uh, they're going to disappear when you die. All your possessions are going to have to be given up. Uh, whatever status you have require, acquired in this life is going to have to go when you die. Uh, all the people that you love, and this is kind of one of the hardest things with dying, everyone you love in this life are going to have to disappear when you pass away. And so if you invest only in those things that belong to this very life, when you die, how are you going to feel? And of course, the reality is you're going to feel confused, you're going to feel, you're going to feel terrible, because you have spent your life building up things, and now everything has to be given up, and you can take nothing with you into the future. It's like you are naked in a sense, yeah. Nothing can go with you. And you realize at that point, you start wondering, have I wasted my life? I spend so much time, so much effort, so much imagination, so much ingenuity in creating things that, only, that have a sell-by date. Yeah, the sell-by date is the moment you die. And then everything has to go. And of course, what happens very often with people, if they are really obsessed with creating things that belong to this life, whether it's wealth or whatever it is, not only do they forget about the spiritual path, but very often they do things that are counter to the spiritual path, yeah? If making money is very, very important to you, very likely you will take some shortcuts, yeah? Very likely you will do things that actually are immoral. So when you come to the end of your life, not only can you not take anything with you, but the one thing that we take with you is a negative mind state, a mind state that has remorse, a mind state that has regrets. So actually, you, uh, you have a terrible, even worse consequences than you would have just by letting everything go. Huh? And so what the Buddha says is that instead of just uh, investing in things that have such a very short-term uh, sell-by date or use-by date, uh, or whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, you should invest in things that are much more long-lasting, uh, 
things that are really kind of big, yeah, things that actually you can take with you into the future, even after you die here. And so that becomes your new investment strategy here. And so how do you invest in that? And to understand how to invest in that, you have to understand, first of all, what it is that you take with you. And of course, from a Buddhist idea, what you take with you is your mind. Yeah, When you die, the body has to go, everything has to go. There's only one thing that remains when you die, and that is your mind. So you should invest in your mind. That is basically what it is about, and that is what kamma means. Yeah, the, the kamma is investing in your mind. You're building up good qualities within. You take those good qualities when you die, and then you will feel happy in your future existence. What does that mean in practice? Does that mean you have to become a monk and monk straight away? Not straight away. You can wait a little bit, but <laughs> no, I'm messing around. Not, you don't actually have to become a monk and at all. What really matters is how you live your life, right? What, how do you deal with uh, uh, any kind of situation with your family, with your, with your, uh, uh, with, with your work, uh, uh, with your spiritual community, all of these kind of things? How you live starts to become incredibly important. Uh, that is how you invest for the long term. Uh, you change your attitude to the people around you. Yeah? You act with more kindness. Uh, you understand that saying bad things to people around you only has a negative effect. Uh, you start to think differently. Yeah? You start to have more compassion for the world. Uh, you start to understand how we're all in the same boat, all have far too much suffering in our life. Uh, never think that you are the only person who suffers. Uh, it's very easy to be self-centered in this life and think about my suffering. Actually, everyone around you is exactly the same. Uh, and once you start to see people in that way, you have far more compassion. Uh, when you see the war in Ukraine, you see people hurting each other, really. That's what it kind of comes down to. Huh? You can call one a perpetrator if you want to and the other one the victim, but actually everyone is really a victim at the end of the day. Huh? And so compassion all around is very useful. Huh? So you change from short-term strategy into long-term strategy. Huh? And the long-term strategy is about the qualities of your heart, huh? how you live your life. Huh? And you start to understand that this is incredibly, incredibly important huh? because your life can often short yeah for me it seems like only yesterday that i was 20 or 25 but now almost 60 kind of scary isn't it what happened to those 40 years i've been a monk for 30 and it seemed like ordained just yesterday and i've been a monk for almost 30 years and so you realize how quickly it goes i'll read out for you afterwards the sutta that talks about the shortness of the human life and i think you and this is one of my kind of, I always say it's one of my favorite suttas, but I, there is exactly 84,000 suttas according to certain counts. And so I have 84,000 favorite suttas. That's the kind of the downside of saying you have your favorite sutta. But it talks about the shortness of life and the uncertainty of it. And once you start to kind of put together the uncertainty of life, together with the idea of long-term strategy, yeah, it's almost as if the kind of lights go on, the sense of urgency starts to happen inside of you. Now is the time to be kind, not in one second, right now. Okay, how can I be kind right now? Okay, I'm gonna to have to have compassion for all of you, yeah? I'm gonna to have to be kind to all of you. I'm gonna to have to speak to a nice way to all of you, and you have to do the same thing back to me and to each other. Yeah? Then we're on the right track, yeah? Right now, you have to do the right thing. And then you carry this idea with you at the back of your mind throughout the day because you understand how important it is. Uh, and this is how we have mindfulness in daily life. Uh, forget about just being mindful when you wash the dishes. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to be mindful when you wash dishes, but the main point uh, is to remind yourself of the kindness that you have to implement at all times. That is the main purpose of mindfulness in ordinary life. Uh, don't just be mindful for mindfulness' sake, uh, because then it is quite weak. Uh, it needs to bring with it the instructions of why you should be mindful to purify your ethics, purify your virtue, purify your kindness, uh, having more compassion for the world, all of these beautiful things. That is when mindfulness is really powerful. And then when you come to your meditation, that is when mindfulness becomes directed at the object, and that's really all you do. Huh? So this is long-term strategy. Huh? Does that make any sense to anyone huh? apart from me? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, great. I'm very glad. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. Just uh, checking, checking in with you to make sure I don't kind of uh, say anything which doesn't make any sense. Uh, so that is why the idea of rebirth happens. Yeah? Because rebirth is precisely what gives you access to this long-term strategy. It changes the way you think about the world in a dramatic way. Uh, and I think those people who say that you can be 
moral and live well, regardless of whether you uh, whether you believe in rebirth or not. They're only right to a very small extent, uh, because the game, the kind of the the um, uh, the stakes are raised infinitely uh, once you take rebirth into account. It changes the equation dramatically. Uh, if it's only one life, okay, it doesn't matter. Maybe if a little bit immortal now and again, it doesn't have such bad consequences. Uh, but if it is like this really long horizon, it actually matters enormously. Uh, and that is the difference here. Uh. So uh, that is number one with the right view. Yeah, how, the, how to think like the Buddha how to perceive like the Buddha, perceiving the idea of rebirth. If you have doubts about the idea of rebirth, if you think maybe there is, maybe there isn't, or whatever, try to uh, investigate a little bit. Yeah, Read some of these very interesting books that are available on near-death experiences, these kind of things. Uh, there's a very interesting book recently released called After, and After is written by a, the world's number one uh, scientist that studies near-death experiences. There's a fellow called Bruce Grayson. He's a researcher at the University of Virginia in the United States. He's one of the top universities in the U.S., a very, very good university. And they have a division called the Division of Perceptual Studies, uh, and where they uh, investigate things like near-death experiences, memories of children who remember past lives, uh, and all of these kind of weird phenomena. These things are becoming more mainstream now. These things used to be known as parapsychology. Actually, now they're finally becoming mainstream, which, of course, is where they deserve to be, because this is real science. This is not kind of focus pocus science or anything like that. Uh, so read a little bit about these things, yeah? especially the things that are trustworthy, real testimonials about these things. Uh, and uh, I think gradually you start, your horizon starts to expand a little bit. Uh, I have never had any problem with the idea of rebirth. To me, it seemed obvious that there should be rebirth. Uh, uh, but still, when I read that book called After, it had an impact on me because they were human beings uh, telling their stories. And it actually affects you emotionally. It's very interesting. When you're just reading the story of someone else, uh, it's like, wow, this is really powerful stuff. Uh, yeah, and they have this, they die in some kind of traumatic way. And they get released from their body uh, and they kind of uh, feel completely free from this world right and they kind of they have all these experiences whatever that might be and then they're told no you have to go back into your body again no please i want to go back to my body again <laughs> it's actually very kind of very interesting what happens so uh, check it out yeah because it is a very important part of buddhism and it really changes your whole idea of what matters in life long term versus short term and these kind of things so, so um, to drive this point home uh, uh, one of the most important teachings of Buddhism uh, is the teaching of uh, 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 impermanence, yeah, how changeable everything is. Uh, so I'm going to read out a little discourse from the Buddha. I yeah, should only take 15 minutes so we can, uh, and about the idea of impermanence. Uh, are you okay to hear a little discourse from the Buddha? Yeah, and I'll explain a little bit as we go along. Yeah. So this is um, called the Araka Sutta. Yeah, It is found in a collection of suttas called the uh, Numerical discourses of the Buddha, Anguttara Nikaya in the Pali language. And um, this is in the book of sevens. So they have seven items in it, number 74, I think. Araka. Araka is the name of a fellow. He's a fellow who lived, I don't know when he lived, actually, it's very uncertain. Maybe at the time of the Buddha, but maybe not. So let's have a let's check this out. Oh, okay. So this is the uh, this sutta, uh, Araka Sutta, about Araka. So this is how it goes, yeah. Once upon a time, mendicants, so mendicants is like bhikkhus in the Pali, there was a teacher called Arak, Araka. He was a religious founder and was free of sensual desire. So free of sensual desire means that he was attaining samadhi. Yeah? He was a jhana attainer, very high states of samadhi, uh, stillness of mind, if you like, in English. Uh, he had many hundreds of disciples, uh, and he taught them like this. Brahmins, life as a human is short, brief and fleeting, full of suffering and distress. Think about this and wake up. Do what's good and lead the spiritual, spiritual life, for no one who is born can escape death. Yeah, life for human beings is short, brief, and fleeting, and full of suffering and distress. Uh, wake up. <laughs> it's kind of nice. I like this. Uh, 
And then he delivers a number of similes yeah, to describe how brief and fleeting human life actually is. And it goes as follows. It's like a drop of dew on a grass tip. When the sun comes up, it quickly evaporates and doesn't last long. In the same way, life as a human is like a dew drop. It is brief and fleeting, full of suffering and distress. Think about this and wake up. Do what's good and lead the spiritual life. For no one born can escape death. Human life is like a drop of dew on the tip of grass. Sun comes out, bing, it's gone. So either you have to hide from the sun or you have to, I'm not sure what is the best strategy here. But <laughs> <clears throat> okay, next simile. It's like when the rain falls heavily, the bubbles quickly vanish and don't last long. In the same way, life as a human is like a bubble. Yeah, it is brief and fleeting, full of suffering and distress, etc. Life is like a bubble. It's like a line drawn in water. It vanishes quickly and doesn't last long. In the same way, life as a human is like a line drawn in water. Brief and fleeting. To take a stick, draw a line in water and see how long it lasts. Life as a human is like a mountain river, traveling fast, flowing fast, carrying all before it. It doesn't turn back, not for a moment, a second, an instant, but runs, rolls, and flows on. In the same way, life as a human is like a mountain river. It is brief and fleeting, etc., etc. I like this idea of a mountain river, yeah, because sometimes when you see people in the world, you see people running around, always moving on, moving, 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 sometimes so fast. The mind just kind of is so quick. Yeah, and it's kind of just, uh, it's like, like we're on like this torrents moving on sometimes in the world, this whirlwind. Uh, and of course, as you move on in the world like this, just like a mountain river, it brings all this flotsam with it, uh, yeah, carrying everything in front of it. Uh, in the same way, as we move on in the world and we do all of these kind of things, thinking that life is so important, uh, thinking that everything matters so enormously. Uh, and very often, there's all this, uh, what is it called? Collateral damage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because we move so fast that other people, we touch them in the bad way as we move along in the world. Uh, and actually, we have a negative effect on the world around us as we do that. Uh, yeah, we carry the flotsam with us. Uh, this mountain river flowing way too fast, uh, not having time to reflect properly, not having time to be circ circumspect, uh, standing back, thinking about what we're doing, but just rushing on in a bad way here. Uh, Please don't be like a mountain river, yeah? Slow down. You can make the incline a bit less steep. And then maybe, maybe it can become like this beautiful little English country brook that just look, 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 goes on. And then even slower, yeah? Until you become a lake. That's when you become completely still. You become lake placid. Placid, mean, placid is a beautiful word for flat, right? A placid lake yeah? without ripple. Huh? It's beautiful and flat. Huh? That's kind of where we want to get huh? That's the idea of samadhi. No more of these kind of mountain rivers. Uh, lake Placid instead. Uh, I remember Lake Placid because that's a lake in New York State. Uh, yeah? and there, was, there was the Winter Olympic Games in 1984 or something like that, a long time ago. Uh, and so I remember that Lake Placid. That was a cool name, I thought. Uh, anyway. So that is the, um, the mountain river. It's like a strong man who has formed a glob of spit on the tip of his tongue. Uh, he could easily spit it out. In the same way, life as a human is like a glob of spit. <laughs> that has many meanings to it. I don't, I'm not sure if we're going to delve too much on those various meanings, but you can kind of imagine what it means. It means it's not all that great, right? If life as a human is like a glob of spit, it's not, really, it's not a kind of very attractive simile for human life. Anyway, you may not agree, or maybe you will agree with that, but we can... Discuss that later on if you have any, if you have some doubts about that particular simile here. Suppose there was an iron cauldron that had been heated all day. If you tossed a lump of meat in it, it would quickly vanish and not last long. In the same way, life as a human is like a lump of meat. 
Yes, no, that's, we can, can relate to that one. Um, and then the last of these similes uh, is like a cow being led to the slaughter. Uh, with every step, she comes closer to slaughter, closer to death. Uh, in the same way, life as a human is like a cow being slaughtered uh, or being led to slaughter. It is brief and fleeting, full of distress and suffering. Uh, think about this and wake up. Uh, do what's good and lead the spiritual life, for no one born can escape death. I think this last one is actually very powerful. Yeah, the idea of a cow being led to the slaughter, uh, yeah, moving towards the uh, uh, the slaughter, and every, and of course, as you're moving towards the slaughter, it it really, literally is every step you're getting very very close to dying. Uh, it's kind of the distress of being these animals that are being slaughtered. It's actually quite terrible when you think about it like that. Uh, but we are the same. That's the problem. Uh, yeah, life is short. Every day you take a step. Uh, and it doesn't help if you stand still. Uh, if you have to, you have to move in the world, right? So you got to take steps. Uh, so just because you stop doesn't doesn't help. You you're still going to breathe. Uh, for every breath you take, uh, you're closer to dying. And if you don't take breaths, even clo even closer to dying. Yeah. So you just got to you got to get get on with it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, and that's kind of a nice thought. Yeah. How many breaths have I got left in my life? Uh, one less now. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of interesting. I, one of the kind of great similes of the Buddha, or not similes, one of the uh, death contemplations, the idea of how far, we should, very important part of Buddhist uh, kind of development is death contemplation, right? Uh, and one of the things he says, he asks his monk, he says, well, how do you contemplate death? Uh, yeah? And one monk says, oh, yeah, I think, you know, maybe I could be dead in a couple of weeks. And the Buddha says, no good. Okay, anyone else? Okay, yeah, yeah, I think kind of in four or five days, Buddha says, no good. Huh? I think maybe tomorrow I could be, Buddha says, no good. Huh? Another one says, yeah, I think I can be dead, you know, this afternoon. Buddha says, no good. Huh? <laughs> and then one person says, well, I think it like this. Yeah, I think that I could be dead after eating two or three mouthfuls. And they're like, okay, you are getting close. Yeah, this is kind of getting close to how you should think about it. Huh? And there's one monk who says, well, I think like this. This is just a rough, rough idea how the sutta goes. I could be dead on my next breath. And the Buddha says, yeah, you got it. That's the right way of thinking about dying. Yeah. yeah. So the idea here is this idea that you kind of bring death as close as you can. It is very, very difficult to imagine that you might die on the next breath. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Uh, how is that? It's almost very, very difficult to imagine. Uh, you really have a lot of need a lot of practice to be able to do that. Uh, but the idea of maybe dying next month or next week, that may be possible. If that is too challenging, challenging for you, maybe next year, yeah, something like that. Uh, and the idea is to bring it as close as you possibly can. Uh, because when it's really close to you, uh, it means that you are much more able to let go. Uh, if it is a month away, you're still going to hold on to things to some extent. Uh, if it is a week away, there are still things that are important in life. Uh, but if it is literally on your next breath, uh, nothing in this world is important to you anymore. Everything has to be let go, go of. Uh, and that is the purpose of this. Uh, and uh, the moment you have to let go of everything because it is so impermanent uh, and because nothing in the world really uh, matters to you anymore, then, of course, meditation happens. Uh, yeah, because of the biggest obstacle for meditation one of the biggest obstacles for meditation is our desires and attachments in this world these are the things that block you from actually achieving proper peace so this is very powerful yeah one step closer to the slaughter this is the cow one step closer to death every time you move every time you breathe it has this kind of powerful idea for you so some of the similes in the suttas are very um, uh, kind of interesting here Okay, so that is the uh, idea of life is fleeting. Yeah, now comes kind of the punchline of the sutta. So far, no punchlines. Now comes the real punchline of the sutta. Yeah. Now, mendicants, uh, at that time, human beings had a lifespan. This is a long time ago, right? At that time, human beings had a lifespan of 60,000 years. Yeah, so when it was 60,000 years, life was fleeting and brief. Brief. Yeah, like the dew drop of a blade of grass evaporating in the sun. Girls could be married at the age of 500. <laughs> and human beings only had six afflictions. Cold, heat, 
hunger, thirst, and the calls of nature. Six afflictions. But even though human beings were so, so long lived with so few afflictions, Araka still taught in this way. Life as a human is short, brief and fleeting, full of suffering and distress. Think about this and wake up. So what's good? Do what's good and lead the spiritual life for no one born can escape death. So that is the idea of impermanence in life, how everything in the world is just so out of control. And I usually like to take this much further than this because this is really the only the beginning of the idea of impermanence. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'll talk, I have some, there's more things to, many more things to be talked about, but I think the idea of impermanence is some of the things, it's one of the things that we kind of know, but we don't really reflect on it properly or enough to really kind of grasp what is going on there because it is an incredibly important contemplation that really forms the foundation of right view, the foundation of perceiving like a Buddha, perceiving in the right way, yeah, developing our perceptions. Because from the idea of impermanence, if you really understand that things are impermanent in the world, yeah, that there's nothing to hold on to, and all of these things that we hold on to in the world, they become like glowing coals. If you hold on to something, yeah, you grasp it as me and mine. This is my relationship. These are my belongings. This is my status as a person, whatever it is. If you hold on to those things, but the reality is that things are impermanent, it's going to hurt down the track, right? We know it's going to have to hurt down the track because if things are impermanent, it's going to be ripped away from your grip. Regardless of how hard you try to hold on to these things, they cannot be held on to. And this is kind of the issue here. The Buddha has some of these beautiful similes to kind of remind us of the impermanence of things. One is the idea that the pleasures of the world or the sensory objects of the world, they are like a debt. They are like a debt because the moment you attach to them, the moment you desire them, the moment you pick them up, I have just picked up my glasses. I hope that doesn't mean I'm too attached. But uh, I'm probably a little bit attached. If you said, give me your glasses, I probably would say, no, yeah, I need the glasses. Probably a little bit of attachment, so don't touch my glasses. So, <laughs> So, so, yeah, but actually there's a debt in that uh, because the moment you are attached to a person especially or to the things of the world, you know you're going to have to give it up at some point. Uh, and that is always going to be painful down the track. Yeah? And so uh, you incur a debt uh, the moment these things happen. Uh, and that is the problem with the world around us. Uh. So the idea of impermanence, it counters that. Yeah? It counters our tendency to attach to things in the world to hold on to things too hard because it reminds you that there is suffering incurred if you forget about impermanence. So impermanence is the foundation for understanding suffering, a large part of suffering. And the idea of suffering together with impermanence is the foundation for understanding the idea of non-self because things that are impermanent and suffering ultimately cannot be a self. I'm not gonna go into details why that is the case now because it is a bit more involved but uh, it just to show you how impermanence is a foundation for all of this. Uh, so it's a very, very important thing here. Yeah? And as I mentioned uh, yesterday, and as I like to mention all the time, uh, one of the kind of core teachings of the Buddha, one of the, actually the last teaching that he gave before he passed away was the idea of everything being impermanent. Yeah, the um, Pali phrase is Vaidama Sankara, Apamadena Sampadeta. Uh, you have vaya dhamma sankara. All phenomena have the nature to disappear or to vanish or to come to an end. Vaya dhamma sankara. Appamadena sankara. Practice with um, uh, heedfulness or something like that or diligence or, or some, or, you know, one of those translations. But this is the last word of the Buddha. It summarizes teachings. Yeah, All phenomena in the world have the nature to come to an end. So the idea of impermanence is so fundamental there. So you should ask yourself, are you, how well have you grasped the idea of impermanence? And I will give you, put you to the test, right? Are you ready for a test? So when you saw kind of when about a year ago or a bit more, what is a bit over a year ago now, uh, the war in Ukraine started, what did you say? Did you say, oh no, war in Ukraine? What did you say? Oh yeah, I expected that. 
If you said, oh yeah, I expected that, you have understood impermanence. If you hear about climate change kind of being very problematic for our planet, and I think to me it's very obvious that it is a really, really, really big problem, and it's getting worse all the time, and we seem to be incapable of solving it. But when you see that, do you think, oh no, climate change, the world is going to go to the dogs? Poor dogs, and I wouldn't want to inherit that world. But anyway, they're going to get it, whether they want to or not. The world is going to die. So what would you do? You, do you think that, yes, well, that's the way things are, the world that can be expected? Or do you think, oh, no, again? If you think that climate change, yeah, I, you know, I will do my best to counter it. I'm not going to just stand by. But maybe it can't be changed. And if you think like that, well, then you have understood the idea of impermanence. Yeah, You're not really surprised. If you hear about natural disasters like tsunamis and volcanoes, uh, if you hear about the refugees around the world, uh, if you see all the beggars in the street, yeah, it kind of it's, it's really, I don't know, I find it very, uh, it's kind of heart wrenching in a way to see all these beggars everywhere, people sleeping rough on the street. Uh, and you would have thought that in kind of our societies, we'd be able to solve these things. Uh, and it's everywhere around the world. Yeah, it's kind of just, it doesn't matter where you go, in all the large cities in the world, you find these kind of things. And But is that to be expected or not? Well, actually, it probably is to be expected in a certain way. And so the more you understand the world, the idea of impermanence, yeah, the more these things happening in the world are not so surprising you to anymore. So look at your reactions when you read about the news or hear about the news somewhere. Is your reaction one of, oh, no, or getting angry and upset or whatever? Or is it one of... Yeah, okay, that is society for you. It is to be expected. That is when you really understand impermanence. But the biggest test of all when it comes to impermanence is the test when people die. Yeah, all of these other kind of impermanence, they are kind of the, uh, they kind of all come together in the idea of death, uh, because the idea of death is the biggest kind of impermanence in our life. Yeah, because then we leave everything behind, uh, absolutely everything, uh, and move into the unknown. Uh, so how do you deal with death? That is kind of the final frontier of knowing how, if whether you really can deal with impermanence or not. So this is the idea of impermanence and what it does to us and the kind of the purpose of this whole thing and why it is so powerful right now in connection with meditation practice is that if you are less interested in the world, what it does, it makes you more interested in the spiritual life. Why? Because if the world cannot supply you with a good source of happiness, you're going to have to find your happiness somewhere else, on the spiritual path. Yeah? It changes your direction. It moves you in a different, different direction. And that is the power of this kind of reflection. So if the Buddha was right, yeah, it actually has a good effect. And I have to say that I think this is one of the wonderful things about the Buddhist teachings, Whereas so many people in the world, they despair when they see the state of the world, they get depressed. You hear about many people finding it really difficult to deal with all these changes in the world. From a Buddhist point of view, we have a way of dealing with this, yeah? because there is an alternative. Not only is there an alternative, there is actually a far, far better way than the way we had before. It just reminds you. It encourages you to find happiness, find meaning on the spiritual path uh, instead of the world, where actually it is so utterly unreliable. Uh, and this is why this works. So when you practice meditation, uh, you find that you are not making progress or you are not kind of going the way you think things should be. Uh, sometimes all you have to do is remind yourself, yeah, okay, the world is uncertain. Uh, there is no real lasting happiness to be had in the world. The world is incredibly unreliable. Why am I holding on to that world? And just by reflecting like that, reflecting on kind of the uncertainty of those things, you let go a little bit. And when you let go a little bit of the world, meditation becomes more profound. That is the idea of seeing or perceiving like the Buddha, going deeper with your perceptions. Just the idea, simple idea of impermanence, very, very profound. And... Uh, uh, goes directly into your meditation practice and makes it more successful as a consequence. So um, let us have a short break maybe and then come back and do some meditation together at, uh, should we say two o'clock? Yeah. yeah, maybe two o'clock. So have a chance to stretch your legs a little bit and uh, use the toilet if you like. Yeah. And then we can carry on at two o'clock. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> it's 
I recommend always coming back to the basics every time you sit down, following a similar process to make sure that your body and mind are in the right state. And that sometimes you can go through that process quickly, sometimes slowly, depending on the day, depending on how you feel at any particular time. It's always good to check out your body carefully to make sure you are at ease and taking sufficient time to really relax, to really let go and to really allow the mind to calm down properly.
And uh, as you calm down in your meditation, uh, you may find uh, now after the meal that it's a bit heavy, uh, a bit uh, uh, slothful perhaps, uh, and you're feeling a bit tired. Uh, and at times like this, it is useful to find some joy and happiness to energize you. Uh, and one way of doing that, I have mentioned already, uh, another way is to uh, remember someone who you really respect uh, on the spiritual path, uh, like a member of the Sangha, someone who's practiced a long time, uh, someone you find very special in your life. Uh, and many of us have people like that. Uh, and sometimes just being in the presence of such a person uh, gives rise to joy and peace, tranquility, uh, all of these beautiful things. Uh, so just imagine approaching a person like that, uh, maybe sitting down with them, uh, maybe having a short chat and getting some beautiful advice on profound aspects of the Dhamma, uh, and then bowing down to them, uh, and then saying goodbye, and then going back to your meditation seat. Uh, the simple imagination of meeting someone special, uh, and the positive feelings it brings with it. Uh, it is like Sangha Nusati, uh, the recollection of the Sangha, uh, and try to bring some positive feelings up in this way. Uh.
So as you go through this process of meditation, uh, the Buddha recommends two kinds of uh, ways of dealing with the uh, problems that arise. Uh, and one of them, when the energy is low and the uh, tiredness is high, try to use some inspiration object to lift the mind up. Uh, remembering the Buddha, uh, remembering the great teachers in the world, uh, remembering the good actions in your life, uh, the good friends, etc., etc. Uh, and if the mind gets restless, on the other hand, uh, use the reflections, so uh, very simple nudgings of the mind sometimes, not even real reflections, uh, reminder of the problems in the, of the world, uh, reminder that the world is not very interesting, uh, and turn your mind in a different direction, uh, towards the spiritual path, towards the breath, uh, letting go of that unsatisfactory aspect of existence. Uh.
And <clears throat> if you come to the point where you start watching the breath, uh, make sure you do this in a very careful and gentle way. Uh, no grasping, no holding. Uh, just a sense of distance between you and the breath. Uh, and also add some loving kindness and metta to the breath. Uh, this beautiful friend has always been there to support us throughout life. Uh, see the gentle and uh, peaceful qualities in the breath uh, and delight in the presence of such a good friend on this path. Uh, and if you combine the loving kindness with the peace of the breath, uh, you create a very powerful contemplation uh, perception uh, to take you forward in the practice. Uh,
Okay, so <clears throat> once again, just take a few moments just to evaluate your meditation, uh, try to understand the causality that leads to good states of mind uh, and the problems that lead in the opposite direction. Uh. Okay, everyone, so let's have another break till about three o'clock, and then we'll come back and have a Q&A session at three.